red, green, blue shades, and hues. You can't really have life without color. We certainly do live in a world of color. From how we dress to how we decorate our homes, it's a powerful communication tool. It can also influence our mood and even our physiological responses. When you look at red, for instance, your heart actually beats slightly faster. So black and blue or white and gold? Maybe there is no reality when, when we're talking about color because there really is no color until your brain makes it. This is Chronicle on WCVB Channel 5. From sunrise to sunset, a world of color fills our lenses, filtered through light, perception, bias, and culture. Carl Jung says that color is the mother tongue of our subconscious, which means it's something that is so ingrained in us, but at the same time, we can't really quantify. So what is color? In the end, color is an illusion. It's just a wavelength. There's really no such thing as color. You're just seeing a reflection of light off of an object. Aristotle developed the first known theory of color, believing it was sent by God from heaven through celestial rays of light. In 1660, Isaac Newton passed light through a prism and created the first color wheel. But it was right here at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design where the color wheel took on new dimension thanks to Professor Albert Munsell. His color wheel is special because he had important vocabulary words to color. Hue, saturation, and value, right? So how light dark it is, how saturated it is, and what color it is. Program chair Jarrett Min Davis teaches first year students about the element of color that goes beyond sight. We talk about color as color symbolism and color psychology. For us, color symbolism is the thing we kind of know, right? Lo red means love, red means hate, red means blood, red means passion. Now the harder one is color psychology. And all color psychology is sort of not to use the pun, colored by sort of our culture and our biases. And that is key when it comes to marketing. Red and yellow? They have that red and yellow because in the 70s it was decided that that heart racing part of red and that yellow made you hungry. But perhaps there is no faster way to quell that hunger than serving it up on a blue plate. Blue is actually one of the most unappetizing colors on the entire planet. And these are my actual plates. All these years, I thought it was my cooking. Looking for some calm, you might go green. Ever buy something not on the grocery list? You can potentially throw some shade at color for that. Between 60 and 80% of our choices of what we purchase in the store is determined by color. Who hasn't debated with a partner over the color of something? Paint, a rug, maybe a tie? So who wins the argument when it comes to color? You may say green, right? Your partner may say blue. Maybe your cones in your eye don't work exactly the same way as your partner's. So it could very well be that you're both right. It's just all a matter of perception. We had this motivation in my group for a long time to make stuff like nature, because nature does some really cool things when it comes to control of light and, and color. And few species give off more vibrance with a simple flutter than the butterfly. Structural color is how a lot of things in nature get color. And what's unique about it is that the color isn't produced by pigments or dyes. But instead, if you zoom in really, really, really far with a microscope, you see these kind of nanoscale structures. So they don't have color inherently, they're just almost transparent. And similar to how a soap bubble, for example, if you make something clear but really, really thin, will then start to give you color. It is that structure, that reflection of light, that has long been interest to researchers. Several years ago, MIT professor Matthias Cole and PhD candidate Benjamin Miller began to replicate the color phenomenon, but like many before them, had run into a scalability issue. I'd gotten some interest of this from people that say, let's put this into textiles. But if you have 10 centimeters of a fiber, that makes a very small shirt. Ben says for years it was try and fail, until a happy accident in a holography art space at MIT gave him an idea. Suddenly realized that this whole field of holography actually has a lot of similarities to how nature produces color. But there was still a missing piece to the puzzle. 
They found it in the science behind a Nobel Prize given more than a century ago. Gabriel Lippmann. So he was this uh, physicist who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1908 for this type of color photography. We kind of stumbled across his work and realized that actually combining that with the holography things we've been looking at with this kind of nature-inspired color gave us all the pieces that we needed to develop this scalable approach. He uses a light source and a mirror and then a holographic material Lippmann's technique allows you to create a standing wave, uh, and that creates patterns in these films. And with that, the butterfly effect. Stretchable, scalable, bio-inspired materials. And as you stretch it, these embedded nanostructures will kind of change size themselves, which in turn changes the color of light that comes back. So we're kind of making yeah, an elastic, squishy version of the sort of thing that you find in nature. And one of the first uses MIT is exploring for that stretchy, color-changing material is in the medical field. One possible application of the material is in bandages to help people who are applying them use just the right amount of pressure, which could be measured by the changing color. And of course, when it comes to fashion, there are endless possibilities for fabric that changes color.